So these are the 12, uh, 12 principles. And I should say that 12 principles are, like any principles of framework, aren't, um, you know, don't come from on high on stone tablets or anything else. Frameworks are thrown out into the scientific community to be beaten up and to be ripped apart and put back together and, and, uh, and to see if they have any utility or any value. Uh, and what is um, useful about these is that they're, they've been around for coming on 20 years, uh, out there uh, with lots of uh, discussion, and they are, at this point, widely used. Uh, and we can talk a lot more about this. But let's talk about principle one. It's better to prevent waste than to treat or clean up waste after it's formed. So the reason that it's necessary to state this is because the entire history of environmental protection has been that, you know, you just treat and control your waste and all's well with the world. Okay? So that has been, the whole, whole industries have sprouted up to clean up after wasteful manufacturing processes, wasteful uh, end of life. Uh, but there's, there's an inherent problem with the create and clean up waste issue. And the one has to do with the laws of thermodynamics. Okay? So we, we talk about, well, we'll make sure that if uh, that we'll close our, our loops, there won't be any emissions, there won't be any uh, exposure to people, uh, workers, or consumers, there won't be any exposure uh, to the air, to the water. These loops stay closed, based on thermodynamics, right up until they don't, and they dissipate. And when we're talking about substances that persist, that bioaccumulate, that build up into our bodies and the biosphere, the idea of well, it's okay if we can cre uh, create it, we'll just clean it up, becomes um, an experiment that we've run for many, many decades and, and shown that it doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And uh, of course, anything I say, please feel free to challenge. But the other issue is that, does it cost money to treat or clean up waste? Does it cost energy? Do you have to uh, expend energy to separate the waste, to clean it, to treat it? And it? Does it add performance to a product? Does it add efficiency to a manufacturing scheme? Why have we thought that environmental issues cost a lot of money for decades? Because this has largely been the approach that we've used. Our approach to dealing with these issues has largely meant that you were going to have a significant expenditure. Principle two, synthetic methods should be designed to maximize the incorporation of all materials used, uh, uh, that are used into the final product. Basically, if you're going to put an atom in, you want it to wind up in your product and not into your waste stream. It's a concept called atom economy. We're going to talk a lot about it, and we're going to uh, be able to actually measure what's the atom economy of these transformations. Principle three. However, practical synthetic methods should be designed to use and generate substances that possess little or no toxicity to human health and the environment. So we captured this. So you want to use, whether it's uh, your reagents, your feedstocks, um, um, and all of these transformations that possess little or no toxicity to human health and the environment. And toxicity really is probably better understood as hazard, well, more generally. Principle four, the products. Chemical products should be designed to pre preserve efficacy of function. So not that you have a very nice soap that's, that, that uh, doesn't have any toxicity, but it doesn't work as a soap. Preserve the efficacy of function while uh, minimizing uh, toxicity. Okay? This is going to be a large section of this class. When we start talking about molecular design, we start talking about hazard reduction. This is what we're talking about. Auxiliary substances. There's a whole lot of things that go into manufacturing. There are solvents, there are separation agents, there's, there's energy that's put in um, to, uh, to bring about separations that we'll talk a lot about, and these can make up a huge percentage of the waste stream. In pharmaceuticals, it's estimated that 80% of the waste are the solvents that are used 
in the manufacturing process. So we can't underestimate this. So that they, there are ways to not only come up with alternative solvents and other auxiliaries that are less toxic, but also ways to eliminate them completely. Principle six, energy. Energy and the nature of its energy needs to be understood. How much embedded energy is going into the harvesting or mining? How much, of, uh, how much energy is going into the, the manufacture? The separations, the isolation, the purifications, and the nature of that energy. Is it renewable? Is it, uh, is it fossil? Is it depleting? Principle seven, a raw material, this is our, our feedstocks question, should be renewable rather than depleting, rather than technically and economically practicable. Renewable. Renewable in what kind of time frame? Oil's renewable. It just need a few million years. So not on a geologic time frame. We're talking on a human time scale. If you're, if you're not able to renew this on uh, your, your materials uh, on a time frame, then they're, you're definitionally depleting. Principle eight. This is more subtle. It's a, actually a, in order to get from A to B, many times you have to go through A double prime, a, a prime, A double prime, A triple prime, and you transform it on your way to, to B. That has been the way for 100 years, coming up with ways of, instead of going through all of those other steps that generate all kinds of waste, use all kinds of material, instead come up with ways the way you can eliminate these, these steps. Catalysis. We are going to devote a whole focus to catalysis. We'll be discussing what catalysis is and the spoiler alert. Catalysis allows you to make product with less energy, less material, less waste, and there's not a petrochemical, pharmaceutical, specialty chemical company that would be in business today without it. Principle 10, products should be designed so at the end of their function, they do not persist in the environment and they break down into innocuous degradation products. I didn't say biodegradation products, degradation products. This definition leaves open that you want to have you know, both natural degradation as well as triggered degradation so that you can break it down into building blocks that can be used for other upcycling purposes. So there are ways to break down plastics, for instance, down into the basic building block monomers so that you can use them as virgin plastic once again. Um, investigating what this means so that they don't you know, last um, forever or build up in the bodies of the biosphere. Analytical methodologies um, should be developed so that we can test in real time, in process, in field, rather than as has been done for so long after you create the, the contamination or after you've generated the waste, you then measure it and say, oops, look what we have to deal with now. Real-time analysis. And then principle 12, substances and the form of these substances uh, should be used to minimize the potential for chemical accidents, including fires, explosions, releases. You don't want to have pollution prevention and accident prevention working at opposite goals. You have to align these so that accident prevention and there are inherent ways that you can uh, engage in chemical safety.